So, what do you think about the foreign policy in the United States? Today, I am on location, nowhere close to where I would normally broadcast. Oh, apparently we just went live now. Oh, okay, I just did the spiel, and nobody heard me except for the hot mic, but I have a guest today, a guest that has been on the show before. Greg, are you still there? Greg, Greg may have stepped out for a moment. Oh, you, uh, okay. Can you hear me, Greg? <laughs> you mean Greg number two or Greg number one? I think Greg number one. Okay. That would be you, Greg. <laughs> yes, right. So we were just getting into why am I out in this location today in the not-too-hot sun, surrounded by seagulls. There was supposed to be another guest, but the other guest has ghosted me. But thankfully, I do have Greg. So how is it going, Greg? Gee, gee. And Greg is also, gee, like, gee. in the middle of the public somewhere, so he's a little quiet, but that's okay. So Yeah, hopefully it, I can't yell. I'll try not to yell. No problem. We'll see. So what, what is new in the life of Greg? Let's, let's start with that. Category theory. Category theory. Oh, that's exciting. So what, what is your involvement with category theory? Well, specifically, I'm looking at sheet theory. Okay. So is sheet theory like a subset of category theory? No, category theory kind of fits over top of a lot of different types of mathematics. Right, because it's basically like a really general set of tools or a very, very general theory that describes a lot of different things that you could do with math. And would the, am I interpreting right that sheep theory would be one of the things that you can do with it? Indeed. Okay, so what are you doing with sheep theory? Let's start with that. Well, specifically, I guess I'm working on an assignment. I was chatting with a professor at the local university from my location. Okay. And I was, okay, well, a little bit of background. I have form an algebra. What was the first word, sorry? Deform. Deform. Or deformation okay. of an algebra. Okay. And I was questioning said professor about what kinds of physical examples. Because in physics, you can talk about a number of different things. And because I kind of bounce back and forth conceptually between the two, I've been thinking about waves and okay. deformation of algebra. So, so pause for a second there. So when you say between the two, sure. do you mean algebra and sheets or to something else? Physics and math. Oh, physics and math generally. Algebra. Okay. But algebra and sheets, actually. Because okay. sheet theory is, is workable over topology. Right. Um, using set theory, yeah. So really, um, sheet theory is related to being able to take a system of objects and then restrict to some kind of substructure. Okay. Or local data. You can restrict to there is some kind of locality property, but it works in algebra, it works in topology. And it works in geometry, which basically comes under topology. Okay. So 
I was asking that professor about how to deform an algebra. Which is an interesting question. Okay. Well, yeah, because I've been bugging professors about algebraic deformation for a few years, and I, as my understanding has grown, so do my questions. They, they grow also. Right. So when you think of division, like E divided by B, okay. especially where they are integers, if A and B are integers, and then you evaluate that, then you get a repeating decimal place. Okay. Now, when you stay within the idea of division or a quotient, then you can think of that quotient in a different way. You're still kind of doing division, but you can think of something called a quotient space. Okay. And so you can think of, for example, polynomials, just polynomials, say over one variable. Okay. And you can think of, you can think so, of- So when you say polynomials over one va polynomials. variable, so like that would include things like x plus one over, and then the variable in question would be y. Am I interpreting that, that right? That would work. So like, and then x that squared plus work. two over y, x squared plus x plus one over y, that whole family of polynomials over some variable. Am I getting that so far? Thank you, yes. Okay. Uh, and the idea is a family of polynomials, like not just one specific polynomial divided by another specific one. So you're thinking like ax plus one or bx plus c or something like that, where a and c or yeah. could be any number or yeah. even another polynomial. Exactly. Okay, so far so good? Yeah, like say some quadratic or say some uh, quartic or some degree five polynomial divided by some degree two polynomial. Okay. But in general, so you're like, now let's think about the whole set of quintic polynomials with rational coefficients. Okay. Divided by or quotiented by the set of all quadratic polynomials with integral or integer coefficients. Okay. And there are these general properties that pop out. Okay. And so you actually can take, so it's like you're inside one polynomial space and you're cutting it up by what's in the denominator. Or I don't know if that makes sense. You're, but you're quotienting it. Okay. So you can actually look at nothing but the degree two polynomials or the degree two parts inside some degree five polynomial space. Yeah. But without writing things down, it's hard to describe. A little bit. But okay. So, and then what is the relationship between that and the, the sheaves? Can you describe that? That actually might be, I think you can turn it into a sheaf. I think that's the point. With the right properties, you can turn it into a sheaf. You can do something called sheafification. Sheafification, <laughs> there's a word, okay. And how does sheafification work? It's, it's some kind of best approximation for that space. Fortunately, I got my notes and the professor gave me a really good definition of it. Like just a quick one-liner. Uh, but you forgot off the top of your head? But Oh, well, it's, um, it literally is a best approximation, but there are, are different ways that you can actually look at it. Because it's more complicated than that. You actually have to start with uh, free sheets. That's where you start. Okay. So it's it's kind of challenging. Yeah. You look at sections. You look at sections of sections inside of an object, and then starting with those sections inside that object, you actually build them up. So, like, with polynomials, you could probably then just look at monomials. And monomials, you, you for the reminder for those who probably well. have heard of them before, they're things like AX plus B, right? Yes, well, and like you could have, if you took one polynomial and then factored it in, into all, it's, it's uh, well, if you just factored it completely, you would have a set of monomials or uh, uh, polynomials that when multiplied produce your polynomial. You have, yeah. Uh, that initial polynomial. And so, well, first of all, you can do that because addition and multiplication are compatible as operations. Okay. And you can, and you've probably heard the term morphism or isomorphism. Right. So before we get into isomorphisms, so back to the pre-sheaves. So what is a pre-sheaf? Sure. A pre-sheaf is a set of sections over, basically, if you choose the algebraic object or you, you choose the type of object. Okay. Because you can look at the pre sheaves over sets or groups or rings or fields. Okay. And you can look at the restriction maps to subsets or sub objects under the restriction, like the usual restriction map, which basically is just inclusion. It's the inclusion map. Okay. And when you think of a subset, it's a simple map. It's injective. And, and anyway, so you, you can look at the sections in that choice of object space. So you could just look at a billion groups. 
grooves. Okay, but so before we get into abelian grooves, because we're, we're starting to step a little bit ahead of probably our yeah. audience here. So when well, we're thinking about the these pre-sheets, it's best to go ahead. Yeah. Well, it's, it's probably best to just to stick with sets. Okay. Because, um, well, that's what I'm working with right now. Okay. Work with the sets in some topology and just don't even read the topology because there's a lot of details in there. Okay. But, but as long as there's a substructure, that's really the point. Then you so so the when when you say structure. As long as so, there's a substructure of like sub objects, yeah. And when you're saying structure, you, you you're including in that the, the possibility of like membership and maybe another set. As let's say you have five objects in a set, one, two, three, four, and five, and then there's the structure of membership. So three, four, and five are part of one set. One and two are part of another. Is that a structure in this sense? Sure. Okay. If you had well, yeah. I think it could, yeah, restrict, so the initial set, call it A. Okay, so our okay. initial set A is one, two, three, four, and five, okay? Because, you, sure, yes. Okay. Okay, okay yes. And where, how do we get to a sheet from there? Well, actually, but, or, sorry, three sheets. a little bit more. Okay, what, what else do we need? It's just, you need to design a collection. You need to gather them up in a collection because of uh, uh, Russell's paradox, if you recall. The set of all sets doesn't exist because it's not a set. It's a collection. Okay. So you actually need a collection. Okay, so before the listeners who hasn't heard of Russell's paradox, what Russell's paradox is is basically the idea of where you have the, the set of all sets that don't include themselves. Itself. And does the set of all sets that doesn't include itself include itself is the question. Because if it doesn't, then it would include itself, which would be a contradictory. And if it does then it wouldn't include itself, which would be contradictory. So that's kind of like a paradox. It can't be true either way. And so a co you're saying a collection can get out of this paradox somehow. Yes, I believe so. I, I command your job of interpreting. Okay. And so a collection, is it just that it can't refer to itself, or how does it get out? Well, if you're using a collection, then it's not a set of sets. It's a collection of sets. Oh, so, so you can have, it's like a, a second order set, or where like you can order. have first order sets in it, but not second order sets. You could think of it that way, yeah, because then you, because you could put an ordering on the sets that, that it contains, you know, of, of course. So collections can have orders, orders as well? Called a family or a collection. Okay. Yeah, oh yeah, you, you, you can have an order collection, yeah, yeah, oh definitely. Okay, so, the, uh, so we have, we're imagining now like an ordered collection, and how do we get to appreciate from an ordered collection? Appreciate would just be like the restriction of that initial collection, we'll, we'll call it C. Okay. To, to each individual subset in the collection. Okay. Yeah. So like there's so you, you would have a family of restriction maps from C to each individual subset. And so that restriction map would basically allow some subsets to be in this other object and on some subsets not to be. Am I interpreting that right? Actually, I think they all would be. Oh, they all would be. Okay. Over. over okay. So. Over the category of sets, like if we're just using sets. Okay. Which, if we're talking about subsets, we're just using sets here. Yeah, it's over the category of sets, which uh, is a very easy category to work. Okay. And even for the empty set, the appreciate over the empty set exists, but it is equal to zero. Okay. So that's good. Because the uh, restriction map to the empty set, I believe can be shown to be unique because the empty set is just the empty set and you, you can only restrict to it in, in one way. Okay. It's, it's, it's kind of like zero in some sense. Okay. So this and, restriction and so, map from, you're taking it as the input yeah. to this restriction map, the set of subsets of some collection. Okay. And what are you doing with that? What does the restriction map do to a set of subsets? In a mathematical context, you can say like, for for, for, oh wait a second, I guess for any element, for any element in any set. Okay. Yeah, so earlier you listed the, the set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay. So if we consider the element number 2. Okay, which in this case is literally 2. Is literally 2. Then its membership in that set automatically implies that the number 2 is in the pre sheaf Okay. Over that set. So the pre sheaf is going to include yeah, I, the one, two, three, four, five, but it's also going to include other things? Uh, well, it'll include the empty set automatically. Oh, and the empty set, okay. But that's because any set contains the 
he had to set, but if that gets messed with the dark pocket mode, okay. the uniqueness of, of the DM to set maps to it is uh, philosophically difficult. That's what I've been wrestling with for about a few weeks. Just one problem, just the, the Krishi hole over the empty set. But the thing is, in category theory, you start thinking about sets in a different way. You start talking about arrows and objects in category terms specifically. And, uh, so there are certain rules that you use for category theory. But so, so basically, now, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but you're basically starting with this idea of an arrow and an object and then defining rules around your use of them. And then that is category theory at its most basic. Am I getting that right so far? Um, that's part of it. Okay. Um, so what's one of the rules that kicks off the start of category theory in this sense? Well, <laughs> stuff that I can't completely articulate at the moment. Okay. But a set of objects first, and you need a class of morphisms. Okay. So now, now is a good time, I think, to describe what exactly is a morphism. <laughs> a morphism is an operation that is decomposable in some kind of exterior sense. Mm. Okay, so when you're what saying operation, it? you're including things like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, modulus, um, that sort of thing. Now, some of those operations aren't really compatible, but addition and multiplication are, as, as we know, you you kind of build one from the other. Those are very compatible. Soul silver also morphic. Okay, so I, when you I say decomposable, though, yeah. let's take multiplication for an example. How would you decompose the operation of multiplication? What would that be like? Well, you know, it's very easy to think of, say, two integers and the multiplication thereof. It's it's a binary operation. Meaning there's two. You, you, you're multiplying. If you multiply two times two, you need both numbers, right? It's like you're, you're multiplying one number by another. You can multiply more numbers at a time, but you can always break yeah. that down when you do multiplying two numbers at a time, two numbers at a time, two numbers at a time. So, for example, two times two times two times two is the same as two times two times two times two. And in each of those cases, you're just multiplying two numbers together, two numbers together, two numbers together, right? So you're moving brackets around, right? Yeah, is exactly. That what you're thinking of? Yeah. yeah, that's the associativity. Yeah. Okay, and so when but breaking it down and decomposing it, how how does that work? Mm -hmm. Well, you could take the number five and break it down into the sum of five ones, and then you could multiply that by say the number seven, which is again the sum of seven ones. So when you say de you decompose, you mean basically decomposing multiplication into the multiplication of additions of a single. Yes, identity exactly. number, i.e. one. Yes. Okay. So, so we have. I won't say vector <laughs> or tuple. <laughs> okay. So back to the idea of a morphism, though. So we we need this operation that's sure, decomposable yes. in that sense, at least in that sense, maybe in another sense, but at, at least, least in that. That that's probably enough, but I think so. Actually, it might have risen out of commutativity because you can see how. Uh, as long as we stay in the positive integers, five times seven equals seven times five, which is really just left multiplication. Right. Sense, you you could think of it as right multiplication, but that's because it's commutative. It gives you the same. Okay. But to, in, in order to get morphism, let me try and cook up a quick example. Because really, it's you know what? If I can. How can I do this? If we have some math, so let's take two sets A and B. Okay. And let a math phi map from A and B. Okay, so you can think of this kind of like as a function from A to B, kind of? As a function, that's what it's So you, you feed A into the function, you get B, right? Yes. Okay. So let's, let's let A, B be integers. Actually, we, we should probably have done that to, to begin. Uh, from the integers to the reals. Okay. But it's, it's how to properly illustrate how, how, how to give a clear example of, uh, of morphism. Because you, you have two operations technically. So I think addition and multiplication should work because so oh, so, okay so basically it's more so this like might actually a, work better groups with abelian groups is that okay okay so let, let let's take a step back and, and you kind of need an operation so an abelian group is a type of group and a group is a collection of objects with an operation attached that obeys four specific rules. So the first is that you need what's called an identity. And so if our, our group is, for example, operation is addition or plus, 
our identity object is going to be uh, zero, right? Because you can always add zero to something, and it under is this, addition, yeah. under addition, it's the same yeah. thing. So if we were talking about the set of integers with the operation of mul multiplication, the identity is going to be one, because we can always multiply one by something, and we get the same thing that we started with. So the identity of a group is just something that you can apply the operation with and get the same that you started with. So far, so good? Yep. And then a group yeah, also has... Closure. Closure, so meaning you can take any two members of the group, apply the operation, and then wind up with a member of the group again. So, for example, if we're talking about the integers, it would be like 1 plus anything is also an integer. 2 plus any integer is also an integer. 3 plus any integer is also an integer. So plus and or addition in the set of integers is a group, uh, at least as far as that's concerned. So we have closure, an identity, a what's called an inverse so for example for any number in the integers there is another number that you can add to it and get to the identity so one plus negative one is equal to zero two plus negative two is equal to zero so basically for the set of integers the uh, inverse is going to be the negative numbers or the negative of that number yeah that helps so we have closure an identity plus zero uh the inverse and there is one more i think it. Did we mention it already? I can't remember if we mentioned it already. The, uh, That's actually all you need. No, I thought there was... You actually don't need commutativity. The, yeah, you don't need commutativity, but you need associativity, don't you? If you're using addition, you need associativity. Yeah, yeah so yeah. basically well, you can have a plus b plus c is, for any three integers, is still an integer as well, right? And if you have those four things, you have a group. Yeah, no matter how you bracket them. Okay. Now, an abelian group, do you want to describe what an abelian group is? Well, addition is trivial because it's a plus b is equal to b plus a. Right. So it's it's almost like trivial abelian. Okay, but what is an abelian group? Multiplication. Let, let's start with it. That uh, a plus b is equal to b plus a. Like so basically, that you can element, you can flip the order element, and you can commute a, them, right? Yeah. Okay. So any collection of uh, objects well, with it's, an operation. It's commutativity, but we usually use it's commutative, but you really don't typical uh, languages to say a, a million. Uh, I'm not sure why, but you really use commutativity when you've got uh, two operations. However, that's all. Okay. So is there like a more general way of getting to an abelian group then? Well, abelian. That's it. Just plain, like, it's there's... like an abelian... Well, I mean, you can start with something called a groupoid. Like a groupoid? Is that? A, yeah, you could take an abelian group that doesn't have the identity. If you've got, you know, take a group and then remove the identity. Okay, and, and so a is a group without its identity member a groupoid? It is a groupoid. Oh, yeah. okay, cool. And I think it may or may not be abelian. Yeah, so there are these... Oh, yeah, there's this one algebra textbook that I should really send to you. It is, it is just terrific. The guy does such a good job. It's, and they claim that it's introductory question. And, and do you know the name of this book? I his name off you. Okay, well, I'll, I'll get you to send that book, or the name to me later, so we can link to it. I've got so many algebra books. It's not fun. It's, it's such a deep topic that you start feeling like you're, like, 600 years old, and you're just really tired and wanting to that. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> in any case, so I can't remember, how do we get onto abelian groups? Where do we get there from? That's a typical example when, when you're looking at sheets. Okay. Because of the existence of a substructure. Like when you're looking at abelian groups, you can look at it abelian. Let's keep it simple. It's just integers. In, integers with addition. That's so... So what would be the really substructure of the, the group add, like, of addition with the integers? Say the group of even integers. Okay, so before we go too much further there, let's first make sure that the group of even integers is a group, right? Because this is an example of like how group theory, yeah. theory is kind of powerful in that sense. So what would be the identity of the group of oh, even identity. integers with addition? Well, of course, the identity. And it, that is actually an interesting group because, well, it depends on how you want to look at it. Because you use two objects that when added together give you, uh, well, okay, it depends on how you want to build it up because a lot of people are You've got an associative binary operation. That's okay, what want. actually, no, let's make sure we got an associative one. So, is it associative? Well, exactly. So, check. I mean, technically, it's like for all integers A in Z, the property. Okay, sorry. So, we're, we're talking even integers, integers, right? For all pairs of integers. Okay, well, sure. Yes, exactly. Well, that's, yes. So, in, in other words, if you're going to talk about the even integers, Let's let Z, capital Z, i.e. solid, German for integer, be the 
the set of all integers. And now let's take the set. Let's multiply the number 2 by every element in the set. I mean, 2z. Okay. So we've got the set z. And we can take the set 2z. And then, uh... <laughs> this is actually good. It's actually a chance that we can restrict. I see, because that's really just a question. Okay, so all the claims. <laughs> We multiplying by two z. by two, if that's your map. But actually, that's a, a slightly different map because it isn't really a. Yeah, right. Okay. So figured it out. They actually have a different map. Yes, they're actually. I was talking about two different maps. Okay. One of them is multiplication by two. Okay. That's a different map. That's that's a map. Okay. Then the restriction map. That is a map because okay, you got your domain. But, so domain is the the domain. set of integers, right? That's like your yes, your set of integers. And you're going to map to your codomain or your range. Which is also going to be the uh, set of I'll integers. Well, 2 z. Okay. And that would be really easy if it was from z to z, because you could do various things. But it, it depends on what, like, if we're going to try to uh, show that it's a sheet, then we need three sheets. So you well, we, have before we go, before we go, or do we need to show that yeah. it's a sheet? We don't have to, because if you're just going from z to 2 z, Right. And then the map is just multiplication by two, like left multiplication or right multiplication, because it's uh, the same either way in this case. It's a million. But yeah. do you want to just show that it's an abelian group? Right. Instead? Right. Yeah, okay. Or that it's just one. Uh, well, if, if we can show that it's an abelian group on both sides, sure. right? And we know that sure. Z is, or the set of integers is an abelian sure. with addition. Yeah. So is yeah. Z or 2Z yeah. still a billion? Oh, exactly, because we're actually getting into deeper water. A little bit. Uh, well, run into issues, definitely. With 2Z, you run into issues. So is 2Z in the billion group? So let's take, so for many, and we're using the, are we using addition? I think so. Or multiplication, okay. But, so for addition, in, in 2Z. Right. Well, what do we need? Multiplication by 2. We actually need multiplication. Because in 2z, you're actually first multiplying everything by 2. Okay. So what's amazing here is you can actually look at rings instead of groups. Okay. Because now you're looking at... Two yeah, if you, if you have it's both... Like we're looking at a substructure. If you have addition and multiplication, that's when you have a ring, right? Or at least in this context. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Some, some, so some, some, I, some I am going to... I'm uh, unfortunately going to pause here. As yeah. interesting as finding out whether 2z is in fact abelian or not uh, from whatever uh -huh. method we have... I am getting near the end of the show, so is there anything you'd like to tell the world, Greg, that now that you have their attention? Take any quadratic polynomial and you factor it, it'll have roots. It'll have either two complex roots that are conjugates, or two real roots, or one real root. I guess you could have no roots under a very special case. Okay. But the point is, you need to evaluate the square root of negative one. That's the point. Okay. And it, what it means is that. Over the complex numbers, you have the roots of every polynomial. Every one. You need the complex numbers. You need them. Of any polynomial. And that is algebraic closure. Cool. Well, of course, it's not finite anymore. So. Yeah, it's, it's starting to get into the infinite. But <laughs> thank you very much for joining me again, Greg. And I will be here for the rest of the listeners next week with more interesting stuff for you to hear. And just as a reminder that if you like this deep dive into the beginnings of group theory and category theory and want to hear more math, uh, <laughs> leave a comment as recommending as such wherever this video is posted and go to subscribestar.com slash Jeff dash Cliff. And with that, I will cut out and probably add the goodbye song and post. So I will see you all next week. Bye now. Bye. I thought the party was the time.